Coming up next, Webster. Good morning. The Squamish Highway has turned into a continuing disaster. It'll be open 10 minutes on the hour, each way today, essential traffic only. There's been trouble on that highway for 25 years. But let's remember what happened on October the 28th, when the bridge at M Creek was washed out and nine people disappeared and died. And then over the weekend, we run into not such bad trouble because it was a concrete bridge at Strachan Creek. And that's where, with some pretty hardy work over the weekend, they've got it open one way each way for 10 minutes. What's going to happen from here on in? There were dire warnings from the very beginning that the logging on the hills, the housing developments below would lead to this kind of trouble and this kind of trouble has now come. You can't cut off Whistler and Squamish. So that means that Alex Fraser and the provincial government, even if it means deficit financing, better do something about the Squamish Highway in the few months ahead. I certainly wouldn't go on a pleasure drive along the Squamish Highway with the rain that we're getting right now, although at least we can be sure that everyone's examining properly what's happening on the logged hillsides up above. That's point number one this morning. Point number two. We're going to have a detailed examination the second time round of whether or not we're using our college, vocational, and pre-employment training programs in British Columbia. We have a budget of a bit more than $200 million in which the feds also contribute. This morning, for information, we're going to have Grant Fisher, who is the Associate Deputy Minister in the Education Department, BC, and Bob Gray, who is the Assistant Deputy Minister of Labor, involved in manpower training and retraining in British Columbia. Then, for Christmas laughs, we're going to have the intrepid Crispo, who's now deep into the labor problems in British Columbia. A story about Christmas. 31-year-old Ontario man, Gary Watt, driving with a, a, a suspended license, is a quadriplegic. In this province, he wants to go home to Ontario. And it will seem that nobody, but nobody, will pay his fare to get him home. I even called the army, you know, because I know their planes fly. I thought, well, if I can get him to the airport there, you know, they stop off. I could have the ambulance. They mm -hmm. can't do it without... The army okay. can't do it either. Not without a hire, okay. So we'll do that first with reporter Steve Wyatt after the break. It always seems to be close to Christmas when we get the uh, tips on stories like the one you're going to see now with Gary Watt, the 31-year-old guy from Ontario. What is his medical condition now? He's a quadriplegic, Jack. He's been in, he was in a coma for two months. He's just pulling out of that Where now. did he have the accident? Near Cranbrook. Is he a resident of British Columbia? He is a new resident of British Columbia. He had just moved out here from Ontario. Now, why does he want to go back to Ontario? All his family's there. He needs some help psychologically to pull him out of this uh, problem. Who's there? His wife? His wife, his son. His son? His sister. His sister? And his mother is in Ohio, just 300 miles away. But the family is there in Ontario? That's right. So he's stuck in this hospital bed. Which hospital? Vancouver General. Vancouver General Hospital. And he wants to go home to Ontario. And nobody will pay the fare. Uh, bureaucratic hassles and policies, official policies say nobody can pay for it. They agree that he'd be better off in Ontario. Oh, yes, absolutely. His doctors certainly agree. Uh, but maybe OHIP won't cover him. Well, that's Ontario a problem. Ontario scheme. But he's got a doctor in Ontario ready to take him. Ready to take him. Okay, mm. Steve, we're up on your report involving Gary Watt. This is Gary in Vancouver General Hospital. He's been in the hospital since mid-August after his car went off the highway near Cranbrook. Although he is a new resident of B.C., his family lives in Ontario. 
His mother has broken her financial resources after flying out here from her home in Ohio twice now. She has spent the last month in Vancouver trying to get Gary back home again. I've tried the social services. I have tried the human resources. I have tried the Salvation Army, Red Cross, Masons, Shriners, Lions, Kinsmen. And the answer's always been the same? Right. Now tell me exactly what you need. I need transportation back to London, to Toronto for him because arrangements have been made with for an ambulance from Toronto to London. To London, Ontario, and this is yes. the hospital where Gary has to be treated, is that right? Right, because his doctor, you know, works there. Yeah. Now, now, how much money is required here? Perhaps between fifteen hundred and two thousand, depending if he has to go with the nurse. And what you need then is uh, he's got to be stretched out over several seats. And, and right, flies, he has to go right? on a stretcher. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, what did the Ministry of uh, Health tell you? If he done it in my case, it would be setting a precedent where it would he would have to do it with other people. You can't borrow the money yourself. I've already borrowed it when he had the accident to come out here. So you've already done that once. What are the, what are the other people told you? The charitable organizations, that sort of thing. I'm sorry, we don't do that. We it, because it's uh, inter provid providential or whatever mm -hmm. um, transportation, mm -hmm. and what? he's getting good care here, which I'm not denying that mm -hmm. he is. If he's getting good care here, why isn't it so important that he do go back to Ontario? There For the know. psychological. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they, the doctors here have done everything that they can. Mm -hmm. And the nurses and the therapists are fantastic. But it's the family that has to bring his mind back. This is what's been affected. Not to seem brutal about it, but maybe the Ontario system wouldn't want a, another patient of such a long Since term. he has a doctor and the doctor is looking for a bed for him, I, I really can't see why. Is there why. a place for Gary to go in Ontario? He'll, he will go in a London hospital. This much I do know, the rest is between the two doctors, mm -hmm. Dr. Steinbach and mm -hmm. Dr. Sussex in Chatham. Mm -hmm. But w what I meant by that was so that maybe the Ontario health system can't afford another patient. Maybe they're not prepared to pick it up. Pick up the well, another. His, I paid, when I come out here, I paid for his BC Medical for another six months. Mm -hmm. If he goes to Ontario, I'll certainly pay for his Ontario Medical. So now, I mean, suppose suppose uh, a government agency was prepared to lend you this money. I'd pay it back, but I can't pay it back all at once. Now uh, this I have also told the Minister of Health that I would be glad to pay it back, but I can't pay it back all at once. I'll pay it back, you know, say over a year. But it would be paid back. Now, what have you done in the meantime? It must be costing you a bit to stay out here all this time. I, I think I have about $17 left. I've even used the money I was to go back on the plane with. Mm -hmm. Now, just, just to be fair to the Ministry of Health, they have given you a pretty good deal staying in the nurse's residence. Yes. Mm -hmm. No, that wasn't the Ministry of Health. It was the social service that called over there mm -hmm. and made the arrangements with the manager over there, which. Mm -hmm. I thought it was fantastic. Otherwise, I'd have probably been staying here, you know. Mm -hmm. you, you hit a roadblock everywhere? Every, I can't get anywhere. Mm -hmm. I even called the Army, you know, because I know their planes fly. I thought, well, if I can get him to the airport there, you know, they stop off. I could have the ambulance. They mm -hmm. can't do it without The Army okay. can't do it either. Not without a higher OK. They need a higher OK, like a federal politician, maybe. I didn't even think of a federal policy. All I, all I want is help. I need help. <laughs> Dr. Peter Ransford is in charge of BC's air ambulances. He says official policy won't allow the government to pay for Gary's trip home, but well, financial realities may dictate the policy. otherwise. The policy at the moment is that any uh, air evacuation is within this province. We only take people out of British Columbia if they're on the borders of Alberta, for example. Cranbrook, if it's better for a patient to go to, Al to Calgary, we'll fly them to Calgary, bring them back again. But we don't, go, we don't go down to get them, we don't go down to the States, we don't go east to get patients. The ministry can't dig into its pocket somewhere, come up with a 1500 bucks to send them back? 
I, it could well be possible. It could be that it would be to their advantage to do so. I understand he's going to be in hospital a long time. It would be to the financial benefit of BC to send him back to Ontario, let could, them pick up the hospital bills. Could be, could be. Mm. But okay. we'd have to look into that. And that would seem to be the key to the situation. Now get the picture clear. He was driving on his suspended license when he had his accident in British Columbia. And uh, Vancouver General Hospital has urged the Ministry of Human Resources to look into the possibility of providing Mr. Watt with funds to return to Ontario. He'd be accompanied by his mother. Now, I just spoke to Bev Penhall of uh, ICBC, and because he was driving with a suspended license, ICBC has not assumed responsibility. That's In other right, words, yeah. they won't pay the fare. That's right. Right? Mm -hmm. So he's really a BC resident at the moment. That's right. Mm -hmm. But the intelligent thing would seem to be to get him back to Ontario at some, perhaps, public expense. As Dr. Ransford pointed out, it would be cheaper for us in the long run anyway, so... Now, when, when Gary was lying there, could he understand what you were saying? He could hear vaguely what was going on. He has severe head injuries. He was in a coma for two months, and uh, he's now beginning to regain his speech a little bit, the use of one arm a little bit as well. But basically, he's a quadriplegic. How long will he be in this quadriplegic state, to say the least? The doctors say he'll need at least two years of hospital care. A minimum of two, two years, years of hospital care. Right. Now, I can't really blame the charitable people for turning him down, the Red Cross, Salvation Army, Masons and Shriners at the moment, mm -hmm. because they probably have a suspicion that if somebody jacks the government or both governments up, they'll probably pay and get him home. Right. right. Okay, well, you find out from OHIP from me, Ontario Hospital Insurance, mm -hmm. maybe before the end of the program, if they're willing to pick up his hospital costs. Right, we'll do that. Because that might be the key to it. If and he's Dr. not covered in Ontario, he's going mm -hmm. to stay here. That's right. And Dr. Ransford said he would take that to the, the ministry in Victoria this week as well. Tough luck, though, isn't it? Yes, it is. And especially driving on a suspended license. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, he might have been able to get... Yeah. It always happens at the worst of times. And to the most unlucky of people, That's doesn't right. it? And the mother lives in Ohio. In Ohio, yeah. She's a newly married. The family. rest of his family is in Toronto. That's right. Okay, Steve, thanks very much. We'll just... Keep an eye on the bureaucrats and see what happens. Right. Next, we're going to talk to two senior civil servants in the government of British Columbia on an information program, which always seems to be of great fascination to the public, on what we're doing with our money for education, trades training, pre-apprenticeship training, pre-employment training, and whether or not we're using our facilities to the full or if between the feds and the provincial government, we're dragging our feet with empty seats after the break. The public has the impression, generally speaking, said Webster, that we don't always use our vocational institutes and our college institutes to the best advantage. And it has been said that as many as 20 or 30 percent of our facilities are not being used in British Columbia. Last week, I had Mr. Coxedge from Canada Employment and Immigration telling me about how they've upped the money to $44 million this year uh, to increase pre-apprenticeship, I think, and apprenticeship programs. This morning, I have with me Bob Gray, Assistant Deputy Minister of Labor, and Grant Fisher, Associate Deputy Minister of Education. What's the difference between an assistant and an associate? Well, as a matter of fact, we were just trying to figure that out. Anyway, you've both got key jobs in this business. I'll go first to you. Mr. Gray, are we using to the full the facilities we have in British Columbia for all this various kind of job training? Let's leave the colleges for the moment, the educational stuff, job training. It would be difficult to say we're using them to the full because the facilities have to include the employer community and the employer community is not being fully utilized in this area yet. But actual seats in, we've got 17 institutions, haven't you, and three private trade schools where we have training given to people? We're using the uh, day shift facilities probably 80-90 uh, percent. Most of the institutions are capable of going to more than one shift should the need to develop. Well, in other words, we could use the trades training facilities, lathes and machines and what, on two shifts? Or three if it came to that. Is there a demand for it? Not completely. Is there the money for it? I believe the money would probably be made available if the, if the demand was uh, demonstrated. Now, again to you, Mr. Gray, uh, we still seem to be importing skilled people from overseas, the UK particularly, or from Europe. Is that because we have failed 
to meet the demand for, say, this essential business of heavy-duty mechanics? No, I think it's more a case of we're creatures of habit. And uh, since the Second World War, uh, the uh, people immigrating to Canada have more than filled our needs. Mm -hmm. In the last few years, uh, the immigration has diminished. The people overseas are, quite frankly, uh, having a good life there. The uh, available tradespeople uh, are just not uh, wanting to come to Canada now. Now, I come to you, Mr. Fisher. Uh, you're responsible for what? Between the two, you run about $200 million, don't no, you? $234 million last year. What does that cover, actually, in a way? Does that cover the actual educational content of these colleges as mm -hmm. well as the training content? Yes, it, co it covers all of the colleges and institutes, all of their operating costs. So there are 21 institutions that are covered. And it's, it has, has grown rapidly over a period of about four years and has come into a bit of a plateauing over the last year. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the institutions are convinced that there's still a great need and, and there appears to be a need for additional But programs. most of your institutions are actually used for first and second year university no. qualifications? <laughs> Most of the colleges offer first and second year university qualifications, but that that programming takes up less than a quarter of, of the total uh, total budget or total enrollment or however you want to cut it. It takes less than a quarter of the operation. So how many uh, people have we got in, in training in British Columbia at any given time? Say right now. You gave me some figures out. Well, we have 18,700 apprentices in training at the present time. Not all in the institutions. No, uh, apprenticeship training is 90% on the job, so that at any given time you probably have 10% of, the, of that number actually in institutions. I didn't know that. I thought you got all your training at these schools. No. No, the employer is the key part of the apprenticeship training. Oh yeah, Mr. Coxedge was telling me last week, if I want to become an apprentice, what do I do? Okay, well say I'm a reasonable age, somewhere between 18 and 30 or something, if I'm going to go into becoming an electrician. How do I get my apprenticeship training? I would recommend you seek out an employer who has a good track record for training. Uh, make it known to the employer what you have in mind and uh, make known your willingness to take a job that is not to start with uh, an apprentice job. And that was a pre-apprentice job? Well, it, technically it's a pre-apprentice job, yes, but it would be any job the employer had open. Don't I have to go to the union first and get there okay to become an apprentice in any unionized firm? No. In, uh, it depends on the collective agreement in force in the firm. Uh, in, uh, in many industries, uh, the unions allow the employers to make these decisions. In others, the unions participate in the selection of apprentices. Uh, do we still, do we, does the community still sign indentures with apprentices? Oh, yes. Uh, apprenticeship is a formal contract. Five years, <coughs> whatever that is? Four years, the average. It would, uh, <coughs> the contract is between uh, the apprentice, the employer, and the apprenticeship branch of the Ministry of Labor. So first I've got to get the job. First you get the job. Now, okay, I've got the job, I'm 18, how do I, mm -hmm. and I've only got grade 11, and will I need grade 12 to be an apprentice? Not in most cases. Do you come in first with pre-apprenticeship training or does Bob come in? Well, probably Bob comes in first with pre-apprenticeship training. Uh, it's it's hard to determine that specifically, Jack, because it's different depending upon the trade that you're going into and the circumstances that the person enters the, enters the program. Uh, students don't require pre-apprenticeship training to become apprentices. And there, we've had problems, and, and Bob can comment on some of the problems we've had with, the, with that title of pre-apprenticeship, because there's the expectation that if you take that program, you will automatically be able to obtain an apprenticeship. The apprenticeship requirement, of course, is that you get employed in the area that you're interested in. And if you've taken, no matter how many courses you've taken, if, if you're in a situation where there's a downturn in the economy and there are all other kinds of problems, you may not get that employment. So that, that's an item that causes concern for us and causes a lot of concern for the public. Yeah, when he talks about 18,700 people mm -hmm. in apprenticeship, 90% are in private industry one way well, or another. Most of them are in private industry. There, there are some actually indentured in government departments. I see. But, uh, but see, most of them, yes. Most of, most of those come back to the institution once during each year. And they, they spend usually a month at the institution. See, once all these years year. I've been going through the impression wrongly that if I wanted to become a welder, I could mm -hmm. apply to, to Canada Manpower for a grant to pay my fees and my living costs, and you'll give me the training in one of your institutions over a period of years, and whammo, I'm a welder. Well, you, if you think <laughs> something other than welding, I would say, yeah, you are under the wrong impression. But with welding, 
in fact, you, most of the, of the people who are welders have trained in that way. Uh, some welders train through apprenticeship and, and a large proportion of them don't enter an apprenticeship. And it, it involves both training in the institution and, and back to work Jesus. in industry, but not under the formal apprenticeship. Well, right, let's leave that for the moment. If mm -hmm. I want to upgrade my skills, uh, say in computers or office work, uh, do people still <coughs> do shorthand and typing? Yes, oh, yeah. yes. Can I get that easily from you? Yes, uh, and usually you can get that uh, in, in virtually any centre throughout the province where there's a college or an institute. And will the provincial government give me money to pay my fees and do my support, or do I have to get that from F Canada Manpower? No, you, you normally get that from Canada Manpower. There are some agencies of the provincial government that support a few students. You know, for example, Human Resources will support a student who's in a learning situation provided it's part of that program that they run. What's your estimate of, uh, on a one shift basis, we're talking about one shift mm -hmm. at the moment, mm -hmm. which is all we've got, mm -hmm. what's your estimate of the number of unused spaces that could be used in the overall system of trades and pre-employment program, uh, training? I, I would guess, Jack, that it's about 10%. I don't, I don't think it's more than that. Some people have said 30. You don't believe that. Well, you know, it depends <coughs> on how you add the thing up because we have from time to time run programs that are on three shifts and you know uh, to get people through sure when when we it, but it it varies depending on the need within a particular within a particular industry or a particular trade or occupation and uh, and also the, pro the part of the province that you're in is some of your effort not wasted though i heard recently of the fact that you give a pre-employment course to taxi drivers mm -hmm. should we be wasting our time and money with that well there there are people who've advised us that that should be done within industry but now the taxi companies pay for that. The um, uh, Human Resources Ministry in particular was interested in that program because it allowed some of the people who were on, who were their clients to move into... I, I into suppose I'm too hard-nosed. Do we yeah. train travel agents? <laughs> we're not training travel agents right now, but we have from time to time. It's one of those programs that's initiated when we get good indications that there's a need. No flower it's, arranging. It's a low priority. Right no now. flower arranging. Please tell me, no flower arranging. I don't know the answer to that, so I'm okay. <laughs> no comment or no flowers <laughs> after the break. I've got Bob Gray of the Ministry of Labour in Victoria and Grant Fisher of the Ministry of Education. We're talking about training, educational training. We'll leave the one first year university courses mm -hmm. alone for the moment. Okay. I presume most of them go on to university. No, not, not most. Uh, but that probably is another lengthy show to get into to talk about the, well, the proportion of the of Is the it a waste of facilities if they don't go on to university? Well, that depends on, I, I guess, how you approach it, Jack. They, they say, the institutions say that most of the students never intended to go on to university when they entered those programs. Just wanted to go to college so they could finally learn to read and write, which they didn't learn in high school. But, but in addition to that, too, most of them have occupational interests. No, and for I'm some of them, the best thing is, is the university transfer, and then they go to various kinds of occupations. And for others, it's something different. No, I can understand that. So let's just, for straight information from you, Tell me what programs are available for me if I'm a dropout or a high school graduate, post-secondary, no matter what my educational level might be at that time. What will you do for me to upgrade my basic skills? Mm -hmm. Will you put me in a course in any one of these 17 or 21 yeah, institutions? We can put you in a course in, in any one of the colleges and, and one or two of the institutes. And the course, if, if you... If your basic skills are really low, then you enter a course that's basic literacy or something of that sort in one of the institutions. And but you'll train me in office procedures? No, we, okay, if, if your basic skills are really low in terms of mathematics, English, and related kinds of skills, then you'll enter a program that, that we call adult basic education. And it's, it's math and English uh, and uh, a, a, a bit of science depending on where you're headed. Do I have to find my own living costs while I'm doing that or do I get a grant? You can, some of the students in those programs can get grants from Canada Manpower. So, they are the people so that some get of the, the students, grants. some of the students are supported. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a large proportion are not. 
So they have to pay their fees and they attend the course and complete it and then you're ready to go into something else. Fair enough. Now, are there any complaints the Canada Manpower people are always on the edge of getting into the highly desirable training areas? No, I don't believe so. Who decides who <coughs> gets into the courses? If they buy $44 million worth of your courses, they control these seats, is that correct? Well, in the pre-apprenticeship area, which is the area administered by the uh, Ministry of Labor, Half of the seats are made available to Canada Manpower. Right. Half of the seats are assigned by the uh, apprenticeship branch provincially. Mm -hmm. So it's a 50-50 proposition. 50-50 proposition. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. Coxedge was pointing out rather wryly that he'd increased, they'd increased their grants to 44 million, but your costs had gone up in the meantime, well, which I reduced the effectiveness of their grant. Actually, they increased their budget uh, during the current year. If my memory's right, it was somewhere around 10%. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you well know, the costs went up substantially more than 10%. This is your basic problem. How much did you give the, the colleges uh, overall last year in terms of an increase? For operating grants, 19.4%. But that would barely catch up the cost of uh, increased costs of running the colleges well, and staffs and salaries. Yeah, one of the problems with that, Jack, is that a lot of that money goes directly to additional training that, that we have indicated needs to take place. We indicated that the government had some priorities to provide additional skill-oriented training. In other words, you say to them, well, you're going to get this money, but you must spend it on thus and such and so. Yes, usually not precisely within an institution on the specific programs, but we certainly give the overall direction in that. We, we give that overall steering and direction. And you feel that uh, about 90% of the facilities on a, a one-shift basis are presently being used? Yes, yeah. You know, you have some interesting examples, of course, where that's not the case, where there will be a facility that you'll be able to go into and discover that it isn't being used well at all. Like PVI? Well, PVI make the case that there's a lot of additional space available at PVI, but that's primarily by using additional shifts. There, there, there's not a huge amount of space available during the day shift at PVI. Okay. I'm a youngster now. I'm out and I'm... What is the guaranteed surefire success trade that I can go for, or trades that I can go for and be guaranteed a good living? And which you can give me, <coughs> or arrange with Canada Manpower to give me training? I would say the, the trades most in demand right now would be heavy duty mechanic, millwright, electrician, instrument mechanic, pipe trades. And we have, are our qualifications <coughs> as good as anywhere in the country? Our qualifications are as good or better than anywhere else in the country. Supposing I'm a welder from Alberta, can I move in with my certificate and work in BC? No, an Alberta certificate would have to be rechecked in BC. Does that mean do your training again? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, examinations can be challenged. How about gas fitters and steam fitters uh, and pipe th fitters? There is a Red Seal certification for the uh, plumbing pipe fitting trade. Yeah. That is, uh, an apprentice who has taken his red seal in Alberta would be recognized in British Columbia. That's where we need some mobility across the country, isn't it, in mm -hmm. all these? Mm -hmm. But you've got to be sure, I suppose, that the standards are equal across the country before you can dish out the certificates. Yes, I, I don't think there's any particular resistance to that, Jack. It's a matter of, of the time that it takes to get all those things in place. You have a number of players involved. So the broad picture is that Canada Manpower kicks in $44 million. You have a budget of $234 million. And that between the two of you, you utilize the spaces in the colleges. That's the picture. Okay. Anything esoteric I should know about that you haven't told me about? I nagged you about travel agents. I nagged you about taxi driving. May hit technology just a little bit. What's technology? Well, easily described as being two-year programs in, in the colleges and institutes of technology. And... Uh, We've, ha we've had a lot of publicity on the shortages in the, s in the skill areas. Right. We haven't had as much publicity in the technologies, but in computer and electronic technology and in a few of the others, there's as, as great a skill shortage. In other words, uh, you'll give me a two-year course which doesn't lead to uh, technically a, a craft trade, Right. but it gives me a skill that I can use. Yes. It, it, Technology usually has both an education and a training element to it. And well, all of the all of the programs do, but the technology one it fits someplace between university, uh, a university type of program, a vocational program on the one hand, and it's it's in the middle there. And it that's where there's a tremendous demand for people right now, well-trained technologists. And we have the facilities to train them. 
We, yes, we have the facilities, uh, not always the, the exact facilities that we need because there's a, there's a fairly rapid uh, change in the demand so within by this area and every other. If, by technology, you mean computer skills? Yes, computer technology, electronics technology. Um, there are some health-related technologies that are, that are crucial to the operation. It, 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 hospitals just don't work well if you don't have some of those. And you train these people here? We train them in, in programs at about, uh, oh, a half a dozen colleges and at BCIT. Yeah, one tenth to forget them, doesn't one? Yes, occasionally, because there's been so much emphasis recently on the shortage in the trades area. Okay, questions from you to Messrs. Fisher and Gray on the provincial government's participation on trades, technical, technological, and educational training. After the break. Yeah, I've learned two things this morning which you should get crisply in your mind if you're considering, you know, a new career. One, there is a demand and probably space if you're qualified. How do you choose graduates for these uh, entrants for these desirable technological programs? You don't just take anyone. I presume you screen them. For the, yeah, for the technological programs, they're usually pretty stiff prerequisites. Uh, and they're, they're usually a science and math base. And, students and good marks. Yes, although uh, most of the institutions have a minimum requirement and then, and then admit the students on a first-come, first-served basis after that. After they, they meet the requirement. The colleges tend to be rather democratic in their approach to things and have been. What's the surge of demand from women to become pipefitters and plumbers and carpenters and operating equipment, heavy-duty drivers? Big demand from women? Actually, I don't think it's specifically a demand to become uh, involved in those key occupations. I think it's a demand to have equal entry to anything they want. And you and now work on that basis? We now work on that basis. But the demand won't come 50-50 men and women, will they? No. No. But the, the, the demand at the moment uh, from women is getting more attention because for the first time, really, they are having a... An opportunity. Well, an equal opportunity. Yeah. Uh, the other point is that to become an apprentice, I must not forget that 90% of apprentices enter through a firm. Correct. I see uh, on your list here that you've got three private trade schools, BC Hydro, Yes. Finning Tractor, mm -hmm. and the Piping Industry Training School in Burnaby. Eh? Yes. And if you can get in there, yeah, and can pass your indenture and... Well, actually, the way those private trade schools work, BC Hydro does the lineman training for the province. If a lineman, say, in the uh, West Kootenai Power uh, is to take his schooling component, he will take it at BC Hydro. BC Hydro. The Finning case, uh, Finning actually train their own. That is, they provide schooling for their own heavy-duty mechanics. Mm -hmm. This is instead of sending them to an institution. That's good. That's good. They're the only big firm that does that, apart from Hydro, which is a government operation. At the moment, that is correct. Uh, other firms have done this in the past and may in the future. And the piping industry training school, the, is that a joint operation? That's a joint operation union? carried out by the uh, joint committee, union uh, management. Good. Go ahead, please, to Messrs. Gray and Fisher. Hello? Yes, ma'am. Um, yes, I'm wondering. I'm uh, 25, 26 years old, and I'm in a basic and a basically in a good uh, background of clerical and I've decided to go into a different field. Okay, how would you go about it? That's a bad line. We'll just have to make her listen on the line. She wants to change her way of life and get into a career. 25, 26. Mm -hmm. What's your education? Excuse me. Um, the question I want to propose is that I have gone to two different fields through the manpower system. Mm -hmm. And the first one was, um, I don't want to really mention the course, but it was on the job training known as the industrial training program. Right. For which 40 to 60 percent of your wages can be paid to the employer. Um, I found after 11 months of this that the employer was abusing the system. I also was employed by Canada Manpower and worked with that system. Um, he had a number of, number of times he had these type of 
trainees on the job and never really kept them and never really showed them anything. Okay, does that make any sense? I mean, have you had of this kind of thing? Yes, we have. Uh, occasionally, an employer does abuse the system when this is uh, determined to be a fact. Uh, it is run down and corrective action taken. Chop off his grant. Yes. He's being paid a salary to help to train somebody and he's using them uh, maybe as cheap labor instead. Well, there is a, a provincial program uh, running along this line where a, a portion of the wages can be paid for a training birth. What's your second point, ma'am? Um, I want to know if they realize now I'm also going on to a pre-apprenticeship. And I want them to realize the situation that exists there. Number what? one, for some of them, like welders, pipe fitters, there's up to two to three years waiting list through the manpower system. Um, I personally have been waiting since July to hear if I'm going to start on the course. They still don't know. It was canceled, so I started to look for other employment. Um, since then, they've received a telex. It's back on. Uh, it's December some odd. It's to start January 4th, and I still don't know if I'm in. Okay, Mr. Gay. There is a long waiting list for pre-apprenticeship. What is not generally realized is that it is not necessary to take pre-apprenticeship in order to uh, obtain an apprenticeship. In the construction industry, the joint committee training system does use pre-apprenticeship as a selection tool. Mm -hmm. Industry at large generally does not. So she, she can go to an employer and try and get a direct apprenticeship? She could go to an employer, attempt to secure a job for the employer in uh, Hopefully a related field, but not necessarily a related field. Two good points, ma'am. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes. I'd like to know, as there is a high demand in the technology area, nursing is also uh, classed as a technology. Why, for example, at BCIT, they've cut back on the nursing program, and at most colleges, it's a three-year wait just to get in once you've satisfied the prerequisite. Okay, good question on nursing. Cut back at BCIT in a two, three-year wait if you've satisfied the prerequisites. What, what happened this year, Jack, was that BCIT didn't have sufficient money to do everything that they were doing. And they operating on the basis of, I guess, some indication that they had from ministry and others that they ought to be in high technology indicated that they would cut back on their nursing for, this, for one intake in January. What we've been doing with that is to make sure that there's another institution that, that is ready to pick that up. And we've, we've worked along those lines to try to make sure that the the, the hiatus between the time that BCIT would have taken them in and another one takes in an equal number is very short. We uh, expect that it will be very short. But BCIT, less than, six can, less than six months, can control for itself what courses it wants to change, yes. can it? Be, is that good? Shouldn't well, we direct them? That question has really never been asked very directly until quite recently because the institutions have been growing and there hasn't been this problem to a, a great extent. We've had a lot of sessions with the institutions and uh, some uh, with the with the councils, the funding councils, and there's an agreement, yes, that it ought to be a cooperative process. The institutions, though, are still independent entities, and, and they, in the final analysis, can determine uh, in most program areas their priorities. Yeah, but they, the, they work with us. They the, negotiate. To go to the us. ridiculous, if, uh, if the board of directors of BCIT, and I don't know any other men and women, suddenly said, okay, we're fed up with nursing, tr nursing training, we're not going to do it. Mm -hmm. You'd have to step in and say, hey, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you got the equipment. Yes, yeah, and particularly where there's, there's a, a, a great expenditure in equipment, we become very much involved. And also there appears to be a great shortage of nurses. Yes. Uh, appears to be, I'd say. Yeah, that, that's a difficult one to get a good handle on, but uh, certainly there are a lot of people interested in going into this. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, to Mr. Gray, Jack. Yes, sir. Uh, my son is in a, a pre-apprentice uh, with a, uh, a small electrical, electrical contracting firm, and uh, it's a non-union company. Now, I noticed Mr. Gray's comments about the uh, cooperation between three groups, the unions, uh, the apprenticeship board, and the Department of Labor. What happens when a young person pre-apprentice with a non-union shop? How does he get to be an apprentice? Well, the pre-apprenticeship is not with a shop. The pre-apprenticeship is with an institution. The uh, individual then would apprentice with the shop. And there is no difficulty whatsoever in uh, any qualified shop apprenticing uh, a young person and teaching them the trade. Even if it's a non-union shop? It makes no difference. Mind you, he may have a problem later down the line, uh, unless he can get work when he's a gentleman with a union shop. I, uh, I would correct one thing the caller said. I didn't refer to the uh, contract between the union, the employer, and the, and the um, 
government, I referred to a contract between the apprentice, the employer, and the uh, Ministry of Labor. But you did mention some joint body involving the unions. I did, and as a matter of fact, they do an excellent job. In, uh, in the construction area, probably the bulk of the training is done by joint boards. Uh, the apprentice is indentured to the joint board rather to an employer because of the lack of a consistent employer relationship. Does that make you any happier? Well, the thing is, my son has been working for this employer now for almost a year, and he hasn't been able to get his papers for his apprenticeship. And I'm just wondering if it was because it was a non-union shop or whether there was a priority list. What are, should it normally take this long? It should not take that long. Uh, normally, there's a maximum of about a six-month uh, uh, probation period for a new apprentice. I would suggest that your son contact the apprenticeship branch and uh, discuss this with a counselor. Okay, dokie, after the break with Graham Fisher. Grant Fisher of the Education Department and Bob Gray of the BC Ministry of Labor on training. Go ahead, please. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'd like to pose a, a question um, to both gentlemen. As long as the trade union movement is exempted from the anti-combines law, and we have closed shop existing in this province, and most of the apprenticeship gentlemen uh, that, that approve apprenticeships are from the construction trade unions, how, does, how do you intend to break what would appear to be a conflict of interest and open up these trades to women and to the disadvantages, uh, disadvantaged. I myself tried uh, to do this, um, but the, the powers are, are too overwhelming. Um, specifically, elevator mechanics, uh, pipe fitters, boiler makers, refrigeration workers, um, all of these uh, particularly high paying situations We've got your appear question. to be price fixed. <coughs> Good question. <coughs> he says there is a closed shop combine which prevents the ordinary guy from getting in. Well, the facts are that most of the training is not carried out in the construction uh, group. In the uh, construction group he referred to, the, uh, the joint boards uh, make the selections, and the joint boi boards are composed of both union and uh, management people. But well, that means in the construction group you've got to be kind of at least quasi-union approved. That's correct. Mm -hmm. That's correct. In industry at large, the selection is made by uh, in many cases, the employer alone, in some cases, uh, jointly with unions, in other cases, by the employer with uh, union uh, acceptance, in the non union situation, by the employer directly. So but he's got to change his target and get away. If he objects to the unions, he's got to go the other way. That's correct. What do you say to that, Colin? Uh, Mr. Webster, I am very much pro union. Uh, I'm not particularly um, uh, fond of the. Uh, trade union movement from the south of the border. I'd love to see Canadian trade unions uh, in British Columbia, but unfortunately they appear to be more or less controlled uh, because they're exempted from the anti-combines law. Well, that's a slightly different topic, Canadian or so-called Canadian unions or something else again, but thanks for your call. Go ahead, please. Yes, um, I hope one of the two gentlemen can help me with my question. My husband, um, he attended a pre-apprenticeship program but when he came out of that he went to work like for different bricklayers and then plus he was working on his own now like the building has slowed down so he got hired on by a union company and like they didn't know where to place him first year third year whatever apprentice so they gave him a trial and they he worked so good that they put him at fourth year apprentice so when he phoned the apprenticeship board to get in he has to go to PVI, he has to start at the very beginning and go through that. Like he has to start all over again. Bob Gray? Yes, I will speak to that. Uh, I can understand the dilemma he's in. There is no way of grading him. There's no way of finding out exactly where he sits. There are two routes to uh, acquiring uh, trades qualifications. One is by experience and writing an examination. Mm -hmm. The other is by taking an apprenticeship. The best route is by taking the apprenticeship, but for someone who has a lot of experience, and in this case it would be the equivalent of more than four years' experience, there is an examination available.
Can and he take that examination? If he can, if he can provide evidence of, ex of the experience. Well, he's got something. The guy says, you're good enough, we think, to be a fourth-year apprentice. All right. He could work at that a bit longer as a fourth-year apprentice and then maybe read up on it and try for his... If, if he is, in fact, a as good as he sounds, then there is an avenue for the employer to give him credit towards his time. So, uh, in other words, he can, uh, he can just put in his hours to become a journeyman? And then, when he does that, write the test? Not quite. Not quite. Then I don't understand. All right. The test is available for those who have worked at a trade uh -huh. for at least four years. And it is available in some trades only. Uh -huh. in, in such a case, rather than having uh, a person who probably has a good facility at the trade repeat what he has learned, there is an avenue for taking an examination and uh, but acquiring... But what he's got to do is four years. He has to have a minimum of four years. On the job training of some kind. Well, that might be something for your old man to look into. Well, say, okay, he's been at it for three years, but he's qualified, the, uh, the company has him as a fourth year. Well, no, he's got to do his four years before he can read up and sit the exam, isn't that, that right? That is correct. With whom would he sit that exam? Apprenticeship branch. With the apprenticeship branch? Actually, it's referred to as 8,000 hours at the trade. Okay. Yeah. That's so he's got to prove that he's been working for four but years. I would suggest that an interview with a, a counselor at the apprenticeship branch would be worthwhile. Last call. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Jack. Good morning. Uh, I'd address this uh, question to uh, Bob Gray. In view of the fact that 80% uh, of a, an apprentice's training time is on the job, the other 20% in school, what regulations do we have in British Columbia for standardization and testing? of on-the-job training of apprentices. For example, in the lumber industry, so we get uh, apprentices from a small plant that are equally as good and equally as well trained as apprentice from a large plant that has an excellent training program. We do not have regulations per se. What we, we accomplish that by the use of our counselors. Our counselors are expected to visit the apprentice at his work site and monitor the training he achieves. The, uh, the problem is uh, very real. A small employer with limited facilities cannot give as good training normally as a large employer with uh, more uh, extensive facilities. Uh, you're obviously asking this question for a reason. You're in the lumber industry. That's correct. Yeah, and you don't like the guys from small plants. No, it's not that. It's that there's a vast difference of opportunities for training uh, from plant to plant. There is one. In the, uh, in the lumber industry, as a matter of fact, in the interior of the province, there is a program uh, being carried out now by a number of the smaller operators jointly. And the intention of that program is to uh, pool their resources for training purposes. Fair enough. Well, gentlemen, we've just did a little snippet at the subject again today. And I didn't nag you about the overall budget cuts because you're a civil servant, not a politician. Oh, good. Thanks. <laughs> Fair enough. My thanks to Grant Fisher, Associate Deputy Minister, in education, I'm Bob Gray, Assistant Deputy Minister in Labour. And I'll be back. I'm going to cover some more Labour stuff this morning. First, we're going to meet Mon Monty Alton of the Steelworkers, and then John Crispo, whom I hope is in high gear in Labour this morning after the break. Oh, BC fed last week. I was reminded of a battle 25 years ago when the mine mill and smelter workers and the United Steel Workers were cutting each other's throats for control of the union and trail. There's a new battle on now. Those two unions were merged, and now KMO is trying to steal them. And I asked Monty Alton, well, what's in, the score uh, in the latest battle? Yes, in trail and Kimberley, uh, they went way beyond their time limit. Uh, as far as we're concerned, under labor board rules, their cards have expired. Uh, the second problem is, do they have a majority of the unit? Uh, well, they had at one time, didn't they? No, I don't think they did. How many no. members are involved here? Oh, close to 5,000. That's the old sm trail smelter, Kamenko people all around and, there. And the Kimberley mine, yeah. That's a repeat of the old battle of 25 years ago no. when Steel took it away from the mine mill and smelter workers. Oh, no, we never took it away from the mine mill and smelter workers. There was a merger. Oh, of the two unions? Right. You know, voted voted by uh, the, the two locals concerned. Now, along yeah. comes Kamo, and Kamo has got a good grasp and a lot of money your membership. 
No, they, they have taken advantage of a situation whereby we had a very difficult set of negotiations bringing up the weighted average, also bringing up women to the common base rate in the plant. So they took advantage of a certain amount of dissatisfaction at that time. You mean there was dissatisfaction in your union because you were giving women equal, uh, getting for women equal, equal pay for work of equal value? Well, there was a dissatisfaction in a certain segment of the union. Not all our people are rednecks. No, but some of them are, and they're the ones that went for Kimball. No, no, I wouldn't say that. I'd say that there are a few people that, that uh, took advantage of that particular situation, mm -hmm. namely the Kimaw people. When do you come to the crunch with Kimaw again? Well, as far as we're concerned, uh, there are a number of local votes coming up in the next few weeks. Uh, hopefully we'll win them. Uh, we're uh, uh, liberating some of their members at the present time. You're rating them? Well, this is, if you want to call it rating, yes, we are rating them at this present time. Our, their members have expressed a great deal of dissatisfaction with their organization. In fact, there will be another vote uh, conducted this Friday. All right, apart from this business you mentioned of the base rate for women, mm -hmm. are the KMOR base rates better and higher in other jurisdictions than and the steelworkers rates are right now. No, as far as, uh, for example, open pit mining, our union is the leading open pit mining union in this province as far as wage rates are concerned, and we will continue to be. Came uh, uh, at the Placer Development Operations, where they had a strike at Indaco and Gibraltar, extended their contracts voluntarily so they would fall three months behind our Lornex Agreement, which is the largest open pit copper mine in the, in the uh, province. So as far as we're concerned, they're following us, and they're, they are doing it deliberately. That but uh, deliberately to embarrass you? Not to, not to embarrass to us. To get your settlements first and then they can jump in with later negotiations? Well, they're hopefully they can't seem to bang out a settlement themselves uh, that sets any kind of a pattern. So what they're doing is attempting to follow us. Uh -huh. mm. Came off, come from nowhere. They, they not came out. What have they got now up at Kerimat? Came off. No, they haven't got anything. Uh, that's a that's another little independent union up there, uh, the Casa. That's a different so-called Canadian Union. That's right. Do you suffer because you're the United Steelworkers of America? A little bit of anti-Americanism, perhaps, in the basic Canadian worker? Well, uh, Kimwa, for example, uh, uh, spreads a line uh, that, that, uh, that all our dues go down to the United States, which is absolutely false. The, the Calura report, for example, that we have just filed uh, again this year, shows that we spent $3 million more in Canada than we, than we collected. I publicly challenged Jess Suckamore, the Secretary Treasurer of Kimwa, off to put up $50,000 in a performance bond on the stage at the Grand Isle mine in a vote which, which we won from Kema. This was Bell Copper, Grand Isle were the two mines that were being combining. I challenged him uh, to a $50,000 uh, bet, if you want to put it that way, but it was actually posting a bond. I said, we would put it up as the steel workers, you put it up as Kema. The proceeds of that, whoever lost this particular wager would go to the community or whatever uh, charity was decided upon. The, the, the amount of that bet was based upon a charge that they made on the stage that the United Steel Workers' dues goes to the United States. I said in the last 30 years, 20 years, 10 years, five years or one years, the United Steel Workers has spent more money in Canada than it's collected. If that statement is false, we'll forfeit the $50,000. And Sakamoto wouldn't take you up on it. They weaseled their way off the stage. And they still haven't taken up the challenge. Anytime he wants to post the $50,000 performance bond, we'll match it. Thanks. Yeah. Monty Alton, United <laughs> Steelworkers of America, really? Assistant Director. Right. Much okay. obliged. Good. So the battle obviously is still on for jurisdiction. Which union is going to control the employees at Kamenko? And the battles between Monty Alton Steelworkers and Sakamore and Kemal, which means, said he, having forgotten altogether, the Canadian Association of Industrial, Mechanical, and Allied Workers Union, not affiliated with the BC Fed. Next, Crispo on Labour, after the break. You missed my buddy Jim, Jimmy Boren last week, John. Jimmy Boren is the perfect, uh, what do you call a robot? Androgyne? Uh, if you say so. For a civil servant. He's the guy that wrote, wrote the book, When in Charge, Ponder, When in Trouble, Delegate. And when in doubt, mumble. I love it. Let's mumble this morning. Now, having looked at the national scene since I last saw you, look, how about giving me some mumbles on uh, Trudeau and Levesque? And oh, I don't know what's happening. I think well, all things are dogs. It's been a while. I've, dogs breakfast. I've been off in Maui conventioning, so I've been. Uh, and oh. now that I'm back, the one thing that concerns me is that was that Squamish trip tax, was that trip tax deductible? Uh, it was paid for. I well, was speaking. What is the imputed taxable amount that will go on your lavish income? None. 
None. You mean this was it was a, all business. Are you telling me that you, a tenured university professor, were forced to go at somebody else's expense to Hawaii? Oh, I'd never have gone except they desperately required me. To you speak know that. to a convention? To speak to a convention. A Canadian, Canadian convention. Would Which you one? Oh my God, it's the Canadian wing of the International Foundation of Employee Benefit Plans. These are union and management trustees on health... That should not be deductible. Why should they be allowed tax, tax deductions to hold a convention in Maui? No wonder the country's oh, broke. Oh, now, wait a minute. Don't we want American conventions in Canada? Yeah, but we're a small country. We can't afford Well, no, it. we can't ask them to allow Americans to deduct other expenses when they're in Canada unless we're willing to deduct our expenses when we're in the United States. I'm biased. I was in Maui, so I'm spoiled. I, I, on the merits, you may be right. But let's forget about that. Since I last saw you, what's been going on? What's been going on? Well, you sat through that speech of Trudeau, and I'm amazed you stayed silent. Uh, I I'm enjoyed glad it I was thoroughly. You enjoyed it thoroughly. Thoroughly. You were the one that said the next day he couldn't have been here to make friends, and I would say that's a fair observation. I loved his comment about the mountains. You know, it's time you looked over the other side. Listen, do you look at it from my point of view? I'm a local boy. Here were a bunch of liberal bag men, right? That's all they were. With their hands out. What were you doing occasion. there? I was there to report okay, that. What do you okay. think? Do you think I paid for my ticket? Don't I, be I stupid. Didn't. I wanted to check into it. Anyway, they had a bunch of liberal bag men. And, and Trudeau, and his arrogant and philosophical King Best, was saying, you know, you people don't want a country. You support all these provincial potentates. You won't look up and help me build a country. The hell with you. Now, wait a minute. He also said that they didn't understand Canada, and he implied that he did. If there's anybody that hasn't understood this country in some ways, it's him. But I love what Jim Kinnaird said at the uh, BC Federation. What did Jim Kinnaird say? Well, he, he, he mentioned Trudeau and the reference to the mountains and the fact that it was time the pe people from BC looked over the top. Yes, yes. And he said it's time Trudeau came off the top of the mountain to figure out how the common folk are living. And I thought that was a good comeback. He's already brought down his tablets. Which ones? The Constitution. Oh, my God. Don't, we are not going to discuss the Constitution. Anyway, no. all I'll say about the Constitution, cynically and glibly, is that uh, we're just about back where we were in 1968. Uh, no, 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 no. I, I wish we were. We, let's not, we, 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 okay, we won't no discuss Constitution. It. We've also had Dennis the Menace McDermott in town addressing the B.C. Federation of Labor. He was on this program. I know he was. And, and was he as extravagant here as he was at the Federation that next time they visit Ottawa, they're going to take over the house? This is where he broke the story, here. Oh, well, he, they, these people all do this. When they come out here, they use you to break the stories. That's I hope right. you gave him proper hell. Because, you know, he's winning in a sense. He's building up a lot of momentum for his cause. But to threaten to invade the house is crazy. To say that it isn't democracy when 100,000 people demonstrate and the government doesn't jump. If they did jump, that wouldn't be a democracy. That'd be mob rule. We'd have a different, different 100,000 out there every day for a different cause. So he got himself, it seems to me, in a little bit of a different They only way. went because the fares were all paid by the unions. Oh, well, then they shouldn't be deductible either. Or well, they should be taxable. Taxable, yeah. Well, Same as uh, your trip to Maui. Oh, uh, well, what about some of your... That's not... Stay off that one or I'll have the income tax people on my back. And then there's Rennie Levesque. We've got to mention Rennie. He's got problems. I think the most serious thing that happened over this weekend was the closeness of the vote on whether the PQ should uh, pursue its independent policies, its policies for independent democratically or not. That only carried by the narrowest of votes. In other words, something uh, less than a, uh, a small minority, more than a small minority, almost a majority were willing to forego that resolution, which is to imply they would not pursue independence by democratic means, and that's frightening. The worst thing that happened to that convention, which made the hair on the back of my neck stand up, was the incredible standing ovation to Jacques Gros. Yeah, he, he, well, what, what did he propose? He said all federal prisoners should be put under provincial jurisdiction once they're there. To get they his brother be out. Yeah, to get his well, brother I know, out. I know. And he got a standing ovation. So there's a frightening, there's a really frightening element in that PQ. Rennie, of course, is threatened to resign if they get out of hand, but that's a power play. I don't think he'll resign. I don't think they'll let him. But that's another thing that has to... But he'll have to. He c can't possibly go along with a, an extremist Patsy Quebecois a resolution which ties his hand with what support he has in the rest of the province. Oh, right, right. No, they're, they're running loose, and he's got to get a rein on them. If he doesn't, uh, he's in uh, real trouble. Okay, what else? B.C. Federation of Labor Convention. Last time I was around, you told me it was time I began to express some views on what goes on out here in the labor field. A lot of impressions as a result of that Federation of Labor Convention. I'm com comparing it with an Ontario Federation of Labor Convention. First of all, the speakers out here are more articulate. There are a lot of very articulate people. On the other hand, the floor discussion on the convention is duller, if you can believe it, than at the Ontario Federation of Labor Conventions. And I think the reason is, and I, I think I know the reason, 
The BC Fed and, and its officers do a superb job in advance. Their reports are much more candid and frank. Uh, the left-wingers, if you want to call them that, are on the Executive Council, they're on the committees. Uh, whereas in Ontario, the establishment freezes out the dissidents. It doesn't give them a vote in the inner working. So the only time they have a, time, a chance to protest is on the floor of the conventions. So there's a much greater battle royal on a convention, a Florida and OFL convention here. In, in, in Ontario than here. What you have the lefties seeing here on the floor is you didn't go far enough. It's good, but you should have gone a little f further, which really isn't that much of a, a debating point. So I was uh, intrigued with the, the convention, very disappointed with the attempt to come to grips with the, the delegate problem. As you know, the officers were defeated on their proposal, which made a lot of sense. What they were trying to do was to balance the delegates from the larger units from the smaller units to prevent the fishermen's union having a delegate for every two men in a rowboat. Well, I thought it was for every man in a rowboat, but if you said it's for no, every two... Monroe it's says, uh, he says, every two GD fishermen in a rowboat. Well, look, the thing is loaded in terms of, of the, or the, the, the system they had in favor of smaller locals. And unions that have a lot of locals with relatively small number of members have had far more delegates or far more potential delegates at the convention than those with large locals and large memberships. What's your opinion of Bennett now having seen him in action for six months? Uh, I can't read the man. Uh, I've been around. Uh, I, my feeling is the NDP's right now on the rise. I saw Barrett address the uh, BC Fed convention and he was charged up. I compare him with only a month ago addressing the IWA convention and I thought it was almost feigned. I've got to say these things. He was really charged up for that BC. Oh, he's great showbiz, Davy. Three feet off the ground, you can't beat him for showbiz. Well, I think uh, he's riding high right now. I don't know wh on what basis they seem to feel there's something out there for them. So I think Bennett's got himself a fight. Election tomorrow it'd still be 50 50. right there won't be an election tomorrow I, don't, I think Bennett will put off the election as long as he can I mean is he gonna have an election after this rough winter or is he gonna wait another year if he waits another year we might have a 700 million deficit in the provincial government and have major unemployment in our basic industry he's got to gamble on the American and Japanese housing industries picking up and that's the only thing that's going to get this province out of the doldrums it's in Webster and your calls to Crispo after the break John Crispo, do you have a feeling, though, that we have a reasonably stable union leadership in this province? Because if you say yes to that question, what was it Kinnaird called the provincial government? Well, I... Red-faced thugs or something? Well, no, he didn't use nearly as strong language as, as uh, Dennis used against the feds. I think you're lucky with Kinnaird. I've known him for years, so I guess I'm a little biased. I've seen him in various capacities. I think he's a very stable leader. Uh, he's got a lot of pressure on him. It's very hard in this province to... Uh, represent the various factions in the labor movement. And, I think he does it well. And to be tolerant. It's very difficult to be kind of tolerant oh. of the labor movement here. Well, no, no. It's very difficult also to be tolerant of delegates at, at your convention if you're one of the leaders of that uh, federation. It's rough out there. That, yeah. Those conventions are, are difficult. Yeah. Okay, I've got a call here I must take. Is this Jess Suckamore of Kmore? That's me. Jess, you never miss a broadcast, and I'm glad you were watching this morning when I had Monty Alton on. Well, I wasn't watching, but I got several phone calls, and I just caught the last couple of... Uh, Why weren't you watching? Well, I've got other things to do, you know, more is important he, things. Is he right when he says that you weaseled out of the $50,000 bet? Entirely lying. I don't call him a liar. See, I do, he's misunderstood. I, I don't want any you. lawsuits about people being called liars. Please use parliamentary language. Well, he is, and I think we've got no, it on no. videotape, and people can see it for themselves. I want to know what the bet was. Pardon? What was the bet? He come up, and as usual, he was waffling around. We were talking about various issues. And he come up, and he said he was going to bet $50,000. And I never even spoke to him about it. Peter Cameron did. Cameron simply said, well, uh, you know, first of all, we haven't got the right in our union for us to bet $50,000 of our own membership's money. It? Well, did you actually bet them did that, you was you, did you state that the United Steel Workers of America are, are, are taking money out of this country and not returning it? I was it. What we said was by going by their own uh, audited statements, the only way they can show a deficit in this country is by charging approximately 12% of the cost of running the International Union to the Canadian membership. Well, I mean, really, Monty, that doesn't matter very much at the moment. What is the state of the battle for certification between you and the steel workers up in trail? Well, we've signed up a majority of the workers up there, and we're waiting now to have the cards checked. We expect the cards to be checked this week. Which, who's going to check it? 
Uh, well, the Ministry of Labor. Uh, the Labor Board. Investigators. And doesn't doesn't Alton say that you're out of time on that? Well, just wait and find out just how I could Alton is on this is about as good and all the rest of the things. Okay, you give me a prediction now. How many members are involved up there? Uh, approximately 4,800 or so. Okay, how many of you got signed up? We got well over 2,600 uh, workers signed up. So you got 50%. We've got well over the 50%. And is this the time of year when you can go in and raid them? I mean, yes, are you... November and December with the open season. November and December, and you'll get a decision soon? We should have a decision, I think, on a, a vote uh, within the next couple of weeks. Okay, dokie. It's always been a difficult town, that trail in Kimberley, hasn't it? Well, it's a town that uh, the steel workers obviously never had real support for ever since they got in there via the merger with Mine Mill. Yeah, that's 25 years ago, I think, isn't it? Well, it's 1967. Oh, uh, is that all? Just 14 years ago. That's right. You're a little bit out, Jack. I sure am. I'm becoming senile, Jess. Okay, Jess, I'll make a deal with you. Give me a call as soon as you get your judgment, and I'll put you on the air. As soon as we what? As soon as you get your decision on the certification. Very good, then. All right? Okay, then. Thank you, Jess. Bye-bye. Yeah, you got to watch this. You know, you got to watch a lot of people. Like, you're very extravagant in some of the things you say, too. You're no. not modest and controlled. No, no, no. I, like I, I am. No, I'm very cautious in my remarks. Okay. Go ahead from Leaf Rapids, Manitoba. Yeah, good morning, Jack. Morning. I see you have that, uh, that good socialist on there with you this morning. Are you a socialist? No, I'm not a socialist. That's fascinating. Uh, I'd be glad to tell you what I am. I don't think I'm a socialist. That word means so many different things. What are you? Well, I told you once, I'm an old-fashioned uh, Swedish Social Democrat. Now, what that means is you believe in the capitalist system because it's the greatest engine for growth in the world the world's ever known, but you take some of the proceeds and spread it around to make sure there's no okay. human degradation, hey, or poverty, or suffering. Let's hear from Leaf Rapids again. What, do you want, what else do you want to tell John? Uh, uh, one thing I wanted... One thing I wanted to uh, tell John was, uh, was, was he aware of that bet and the fact that uh, United Steelworkers of America or any international union is not up here for our benefit. We're a money tree for them. And about 60%, uh, or at least 40% to 60% goes out of this country and never comes back. Okay, good point, Leaf Rabbits, if true. You, John you, Crispo. You just can't make that kind of generalization. There are some unions, international unions, that make money on the backs of their Canadian members. There are many that don't. Take the steel workers, which is being used as, uh, as a whipping boy these days all over the country. You just take the, the last Inco strike and the, the, the recently terminated Stelco strike. They have poured tens of millions of dollars into this country. They've had huge deficits because of those strikes. So you just can't make that kind of generalization. Go ahead from Quinnell. Yes, good morning, Jack, and good morning, Mr. Crispo. I've got uh, one question and one suggestion. The question is, what do you think of Mr. Bowie giving himself a 10% increase, a case of uh, don't do as I do, do as I tell you. That's the first one. And the second one is, what would happen? Uh, I'm not an economist, but why can't we put a freeze on investments for six months, reduce the interest rate to 10%, this way we cause full employment, we create exports, we create jobs. And I know there's a businessman, I would still have my money, and somebody was giving me a 10% Guarantee. Okay, you've, you've got the, happen. he's got the message. What's the answer? Well, on Bowie, first of all, he didn't give himself the increase. The cabinet voted the increase. I suppose if he was completely consistent with what he's been telling us about voluntary self-restraint, he'd turn it down. He isn't going to starve to death anyway. What's he at? 95,000 now going to 105. 104, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it's 10%, to be fair, is less than the average rate of increases others are getting in our society. Uh, but if he really wanted to make a noble gesture, I guess you're right. I don't think he'll make it. Who else is likely to do so? Uh, just by the way, wonderful story in the Globe by John Gray the other day. The government is tightening up on everyone but loosening things up for the MPs. While the rest of the country staggers under 20% interest rates, mm. MPs are buying back time on their own generous pension scheme for as little as 4%. Well, that's nothing less than a public scandal. And I mean, you know, they're more hypocritical and inconsistent than Bowie is because at least he doesn't vote his own increase. They're, they voted themselves this special deal. Imagine if we could do that. We could buy a bigger pension plan in the future. He can buy back, if he's 15 years service, the contributions yeah. at, four, with, at plus 
and qualify immediately to 70% of his salary for the six highest earning years. Well, look, the problem with MPs, you and I have discussed this before, is not that they're overpaid, even when you throw in their pension plan. This, the scandal, if there is a scandal, is that they make these increases while they're serving. I think we should make politics a more attractive calling, but we should never increase their remuneration while they're serving. It should be effective after the next election, so you have a chance to replace them with some better people at the higher remuneration. When's your next convention in uh, Barbados? <laughs> I'm not going to answer that in the grounds I might incriminate myself. I'm sure our new Charter of Rights must have something like that in it to protect SF, people like me. Yes, if you're still up on the hill? Still up on the hill, still prospering. Well, no, they got a bit of a deficit. Oh, big change at the top at UBC. Yes, yes, yes. But uh, Listen, UBC, I better not talk about UBC. They want the government to bail them out after the arbitrator gave them 20%. And 18%. 18 plus 3. Highest paid day. Uh, UBC profits in the country. Yes, I, I should have Nothing gone Nothing short of scandalous. No, 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 no. That isn't the scandal. The scandal is that UBC, the administration, should agree to voluntary arbitration, lose, and then ask the government to bail them out. After the break. Steve's back to tell me the latest development on Gary Watt, quadriplegic in Vancouver General Hospital. There he is there with his mother. He's a guy who wants to go home to his family in Ontario, and so far nobody will pay the freight. Steve, development. Well, I've been talking to OHIP on the phone. In, OHIP, uh, Ontario Health Hospital Health Insurance Plan. That's right, in Toronto. And they tell me that if he goes to Ontario, BC Medical has to pick up the cost of his hospitalization for the first three months. Three months. After that, he's had OHIP before, so all he has to do is reapply for it, and there's no problem there. So, so they're willing to take the burden of his care no matter how long that's it right. takes until he improves from his present quadriplegic position. That's right. And I also have been talking so to... That, that, uh, let me stress mm, that. That's point number that's one. Right. OHIP will pick up the tab if BC picks up the first, first three, three months, months after transfer. Right. Will OHIP pay the fare? No, they, are, they aren't prepared to do that. But we've, uh, I was talking to his mother again this morning after I spoke to you. And uh, she has had a visit from Emergency Health Services. And BC. Are, that's right. And they're now looking into it a second time, and they're going to try to find out a way to do it. Now, so that's not official. I the Emergency Health Service have assigned a, a man to look into the possibility of shipping him back at public expense from here so that we only carry his treatment for three months in Ontario, and then they will pick up the total balance of his cost, even though it's for a lifetime. That's right. Now, they also need a guarantee that there's a bed available for him there in Ontario. Now, I tried to talk to his doctor in Ontario, but I haven't been able to reach him. That's up to them. Yeah. Good. We'll report on that again later. Now... Don't forget your tickets for my famous people players from Ontario, the young so-called mentally handicapped youngsters who put on this fantastic show, December the 18th. There they are. And I'm going to do the narration, would you believe it or not, with the Vancouver Symphony Orchestra. So buy a ticket, it'll kill you. Tomorrow, don't quite know yet. 9 a.m. precisely. <laughs>